Right, yes. Uh, debt, I think, of much more specialist interest. Um, and I, I think actually quite often it's a little bit opaque and difficult to, uh, to understand. Um, but if you, if you can, there are quite some rewards. Um, and overall, the returns were pretty solid uh, last year, uh, with one outstanding performer in the direct lending space, which I have talked about probably a bit too much over the last few, uh, few months, uh, VPC specialty. Um, it, it is a high risk trust because it has a lot of equity kickers in its portfolio related to its uh, SPAC activities, which have been very successful. Uh, the winners from SPAC, uh, the SPAC industry are undoubtedly those who are sponsor the SPACs, um, and VPC has done very well out of that. Um, just to illustrate the risk, um, yeah, it had one, uh, a company called uh, Bact, uh in the, in the US, reversed into one of its uh, SPAC uh, structures uh, in uh, November. And they valued uh, the shares uh, accordingly. Uh, at, at the time, uh, backed shares were about the thirty-five dollars. Uh, I checked last night, and they're seven dollars eighty now. So there's quite a lot of fluctuation there. Um, it's a risky. You know, these are junior finance companies they're investing in, uh, usually in the electronic realm, and um, they're quite risky. But uh, that's not their only horse in the race. Uh, in fact, in December, they announced another successful um, uh, SPAC uh, investment. So um, it's very interesting. Uh, and I think if you are prepared to spend a bit of time understanding it, um, it might be worth putting a, something into. Um, if, if you can prepare, if you can accept that high volatility and risk, and, and that's not going away for sure. It is on a big discount. It does have a high yield. Uh, but I can understand the reasons for that. I think the same is true, actually, in the structured finance market for trusts like the um, Marble Point loan financing, where you're getting a tremendously high yield. So sorry, we're not showing it on this slide. Uh, and, and inevitably, you think, well, there's got to be something wrong here. That I can't be getting that. I can't be getting a 13% return. Um, uh, and actually, it's on a discount as well. And you do wonder about it. But um, I just saw some research from uh, Stiefel on the CLO market, and they were actually very optimistic for the year ahead and believe that um, there should be a very low default uh, rate. So again, I think if you're prepared to spend the time digging around and you can satisfy yourself that the risk reward trade-off is worth it, um, perhaps this is a sector that you should have a look at. I quite like the ones in the middle too, though, because they're, they're more sort of doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're yes. not shooting the lights out or underperforming so things like honeycomb and rm i think are probably quite good yeah i think that's right that actually that the the, the problem that we saw in uh, 2020 i think in particular was that when there were problems in this sector trust really fell out of the sky quite quickly but actually in the last year there haven't really been any um that i can think of and uh, as you say the trusts have just been steadily delivering as as they're intended to do um so the other parts of the debt sector uh loans and bonds uh, again there's quite a kind of quite a mixed uh, range of mandates here so it's difficult to compare them but uh, at the top is cqs new city high yield fund uh, and i noticed that um uh, Franco, Ian Francis, is on the show in a couple of weeks' time. He is very good at explaining, actually, what's going on. He lives and breathes bonds. And um, uh, and I think if you don't follow the market closely, it's very, very helpful, actually, to, to listen to managers who really are engaged with this market on a daily basis. Um, that trust yields 8% and has actually a pretty good, reliable performer over, over a good period. So uh, that's not a bad one to, to think about. Um, NB distressed debt has a much more checkered record and uh, actually did much better last year, which was a much needed recovery, actually. It had done, <laughs> done badly before that. Um, in the property debt sector, um, I think real estate credit investments is another one of those trusts, actually, that has just very reasonably delivered exactly what you were expecting. It yields 7.7%. There was a bit of scepticism uh, at the height of the pandemic about whether it would be running into defaults. 
Um, and it did have one or two small issues, but it's worked through those. And actually, I think there's scope for a little bit of uplift as those get unwound. Um, but it's generally been a very good, solid trust, and you're getting a lovely yield from that. So worth thinking about, I think. Um, hedge funds. Um, these, the, the, the BH funds, now, now of course merged into BH Macro, uh, were excellent performers um, in the prior year. Uh, this time they, they struggled a bit, and I think it just depends on how much macro volatility there is to suit their strategies. Um, I suspect in the year ahead, they might have more opportunities. Um, it might be a bit more lumpy, but we'll, we'll see. Um, for me though, the, the outstanding story here is the one at the top, Pershing Square Holdings, which is a real strange situation. I mean, it's, it's an anomaly, I think, in the investment trust sector. This is one of our largest trusts. It's in the FTSE 100 index. Uh, and yet, um, I don't know many people who like to own it or who are glad to own it. Um, I think it's maybe thought of as a bit of a, um, a plaything for Bill Ackman, the manager, who, who does do exactly what he likes, it has to be said, but he has a tremendous track record. And, and there's a solid underlying portfolio here of, of uh, American companies with big brands. Um, but he does, of course, you know, like to get involved with special situations. And uh, sometimes that involves a bit of controversy. Um, and the Pershing Square Tontine uh, SPAC uh, wanted to, to buy a 10% stake in, in um, Universal Music Group and was prevented from doing so. So in fact, Pershing Square took on a lot of that holding itself. So it now has a very chunky holding in, in UMG, um, which it didn't really anticipate having. And, and, and that's the kind of thing that happens with Pershing Square, uh, which is why maybe people get upset about it. Um, but, I, but I think actually that might work out very, very well in the end. I mean, I think the, the as I'll talk about in a minute, actually, the economics uh, behind the music industry, I think at the present time are quite um, uh, compelling. And so it could do well. And here you have, you know, one of the largest trusts with a great track record on a 28% discount, which is a little bit hard to explain. And the last interview I saw with Bill Ackman, he was also a bit perplexed by the discount. So, um, you never know, he might uh, calm down and try and do something about it. Actually, I'm a holder of that, and for that reason, really. Um, and obviously quite pleased with this, it's gone up. And there's a question about the SPAC. I mean, it, so the SPAC is sort of sitting there. It was prevented from doing that UMG deal, and it's not been used for anything else yet, has it? No, and, um, and I can't quite remember the details, but I, I, I think it might end up giving the money back, actually. Um, I, I, I think... Uh, it's um, the, the clock is ticking on that one, and, and I'm, I'm not sure it will end up being used for anything. Um, I, there's, there's just, I think there are still some discussions going on with the SEC about exactly what it can do. Cool. The private equity, um, that, and this is a sector that both of us have been banging on about quite a lot um, over the past year. Um, and really, as Andrew's already alluded to, because um, the NEVs are normally very conservative in the way that they are put together. And that means that when they sell things, they get quite big uplifts. Um, and so the, the discounts that you see um, on, the, on the sector are actually um, magnified. They're, they're actually deceptively, um, they're, they're much bigger than they look. Um, so basically this has been a good year for disposals. And because we've had these disposals, you've been getting these NAB uplifts coming through. Um, and really, if the, the more disposals you had in, in the right sort of sectors, uh, the better you did. And um, Harpervest is the, the star here. But actually, uh, a lot of these things did very well. There, there's, a, there's quite a lot of technology growth type stories in, within the portfolios here. Um, and um, that's, that's probably skewed returns a little bit. Um, what we have seen, though, um, is that Harpervest said it did very well having sort of more venture type stocks. And that's normally an, an, not an area that, that these um, funds tend to go towards. They, they tend to prefer to invest in some later stage investments. But um, if you, again, venture is much more risky, but it, when, you, when it does work out, it, it does pay off well. Um, we took a couple of big realizations in, um, for 3i 
finally sold its um, action supermarkets or restructured its action, and that helped um, quite a lot uh, for things like Stone Blythe and Apex. Um, and then one of the topics that Andrew's talked about before on the show is the funds in runoff. Um, and, and some of those have done extremely well as they've been um, selling off things and coming to the end of their lives and Dineen Enterprises to start there. Um, and Electra is actually another one of them that had a quite strong NEV performance as it's come to the end of its life. But you do get the opposite end of that in the, in the table too. So Reconstruction Capital 2, which is a Romanian fund, and, and Origo Partners uh, languish at the bottom there. They're quite tiny now, but um, it does show you that there is some risk involved. Um, Favourites. I'm reluctant to pick a favourite. I, I would tell you that I do own HG. Um, it just seems to be a perennial winner. Although it might have a, a, a trickier time in 2022 if, if technology doesn't is, is less uh, in vogue. But we'll, we'll see. I don't know if you've got one, Andrew. Um, yes, I, mean, I, 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 I agree with you about HG. Um, actually, I own a few here. I own uh, Harbour Vest, um, Dunedin Enterprise, and uh, ICG as well. Uh, I think it's quite hard to pick one winner. Uh, I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't own three or four, actually, because yeah. they, they are all a little bit distinct, and there's a lot of good value here. Yeah, Pantheon's the other one I've got, and that's done very well. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure why Oakley's so far down the table. And you know, when I looked at it, I thought, maybe that number's not right. Um, I'll go away and look at it, and then I haven't had time to do that. But so we'll, we'll revisit that. And if it turns out that that number's wrong, we'll, we'll let you know in the, in the next show. Growth capital is the sort of other chunk of private equity. Um, obviously, this is this investing is slightly more early stage investments. Um, Chihanian is the, the winner here in the NEV terms, but actually it was the one of the biggest losers in December, and that's playing into this whole sell-off in the um, growth capital, right, so in, in growth style investing that happened. It's on a huge premium. Um, if it does start to disappoint and that premium unwinds, yeah, that's going to be quite a scary situation. I'd, I'd be quite wary of it. Um, the, the second one down here, Chrysalis, is actually one that we quite like and um, one that we're going to start covering. Um, and it, encouragingly, it's, it was able to issue some stock um, this year, maybe not as much as it wanted to, but still a decent amount of money. Um, and I, I think that could continue to go to strength to strength, investing in these kind of pre-IPO pre -IPO type investments. Um, Surely you hit public private, the old Woodford Capital, we should mention too, because it had, this was really a year of a turnaround for it, even though not everything worked out perfectly, and definitely the, the problems it had with um, its radiotherapy business recently just um, uh, illustrate that. Um, but it has now eliminated its debt and it, it's got the freedom to make new investments. And I do think it's in a much better shape and we could see the discount error on that, I think. And then at the bottom end of the thing is, it's a stock that we've, we've not been recommending to people anyway because um, it issued stock at a discount, which is something that we, we normally uh, ask people to stay well clear of. Uh, but it also seems to be hit by a fraud. It, it, it owns, um, we thought it owned um, quite a sort of famous Hong Kong restaurant. Um, and then it announced in December that maybe it doesn't after all. And so they're trying to find out what's going on. Um, music. Yeah, royalties. Um, this is quite interesting. I mean, it, it didn't have the most exciting year, um, but you know, positive returns from the two uh, music uh, trusts. Um, Roundhill did better in NAV terms and Hypnosis in share price terms, so take your pick. Um, I think Hypnosis is just easier to deal, actually, than Roundhill, which is one reason for, for owning it. Um, I do think the economics are quite powerful here behind music, the trend towards monetizing catalogues. Um, if you were uh, taking a, a step away from the... Um, the dinner table around Christmas time and looking at the newspapers, the David Bowie um, uh, sale was in the news. Um, uh, streaming is growing quite well, actually, and I think there is a, look, a lot of pressure as well uh, to, to grant a higher proportion of the, the overall cake towards the artists. So uh, I think there's some uh, potential here, I think, to, um, uh, to, to, to benefit in the, the medium term. 
Um, I get a lot of very enthusiastic broker's notes about hypnosis in particular. Um, the main difference between the two, I think, is that uh, Roundhill has a more uh, has a much broader and older catalog, actually. So they are, they are a bit different, uh, but fundamentally they'll um, they'll benefit from the same kind of uh, industry uh, tailwinds, I think. Um, hypnosis did benefit at Christmas time because Mariah Carey's uh, famous Christmas hit made it to number one in the US for the first time. Um, uh, the, the reason why I think these trusts are of considerable interest is that one of the great difficulties I think that the industry has is in attracting younger investors. It's certainly a problem for me with the demographic I have for my uh, business that um, my subscribers tend to be quite uh, mature. And I think attracting young investors is quite difficult because, you know, it's, it's often thought of as being a bit of a dusty old industry. So if you do have trusts that uh, are in maybe slightly more exciting industries than UK consumer discretionary, uh, then, you know, that, that, that's a good thing. Uh, and I do think here that um, these trusts are genuinely interesting for a lot of people. Uh, and of course, we mustn't forget in a year ahead that might be quite lumpy for the returns from equity markets. Uh, you really have a good chance of completely non-correlated returns here. So for diversification, I think these trusts are worth thinking about and they do throw off a decent yield. So um, not, not bad at all. We're not gonna choose between them. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think you can certainly look at the market ratings. Um, the, the ease of dealing is relevant. And, and then I suppose you, you, you can judge whether you believe that uh, an older catalogue of, uh, you know, sort of old Motown hits and Elvis Presley and that kind of thing is going to outperform, you know, rap songs. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I honestly, no idea. I mean, you, you listen to, to Merck, uh, who the, the guy behind hypnosis. One of the things that they're looking forward to is, is the resumption of, of live shows. So, so they, a lot of these bands make a lot of their, their money from touring um, and, and they put the um, catalogues will benefit if um, they, that goes, goes back to normal again. And there's been an element of that. Um, so you could go in. And, and obviously more of Hypnosis's songs are probably being performed by current bands where the Round Hills are more sort of old. But I think it's, it's definitely six one half a dozen of the other. And um, if you're not sure on both, I think is the answer. Um, leasing is is the um, other sort of um, weird and wonderful sector that we've got that we should have a look at. Um, and it, it is quite different between the, the airplane funds, which have really been suffering because they were suffering before because there was a great question mark over whether anybody really wanted A380s, which were a, a large constituent of these portfolios. Um, and then obviously COVID came along and, and shut down air travel and, and all of a sudden um, things that actually looked reasonable, like a, a Medio leases to Thai Airways, suddenly, suddenly were not um, and everything came a cropper. Hopefully the things were going to be improving, um, but, but I still don't think that answers the question about whether you want, anybody wants a second hand A380 or not. By contrast, the shipping market has, has had a pretty wonderful year. Um, there's only one stock in that list there, Tufton, because uh, Taylor Maritime doesn't have a year's track record yet. But um, both of those did, did particularly well as, as freight rates soared. Um, and when ships were getting stuck outside ports um, and then there were a lot more um, containers stuck on vessels and things and uh, ever, um, the... Um, Tanking in the second series canal, uh, jamming up the system. That just meant things were occupied, and so that drove up freight roads quite quite a lot, maybe a bit above where they should have been. There's been a bit of pullback in that recently, um, but still, um, both of these funds say they can buy these ships for, for less than their replacement cost, and then they, they're getting charters on enormous yields. So um, if they can keep that going, they could have another good 2022. We'll have to wait and see. Um, there's a question about. A380 is whether that puts a question mark over the aircraft leasing sector more generally. I've, I've been thinking that for a while. Amedio started buying the, the um, other sorts of planes. And um, I thought that was actually a sign that, that this sector could carry on and carry on going. 
um, and then move in this different direction and maybe issue some new funds with some new new um, assets. Um, COVID has probably put that on hold for a bit, but maybe if things settle down, there's a, there's a possibility that we could see some funds coming along because the economics aren't too bad. Obviously, if you get something like um, a pandemic, then that, that mucks everything up. But um, otherwise, you, you, you can get sort of reasonable returns from these things. Property. Yeah, different sector again. Um, uh, this maybe is something that um, investors are looking at with fresh eyes now thinking about inflation. And um, you can get quite a lot of inflation protection built in to leases in this sector. Uh, these are the more generalist uh, trusts, and um, they had a very good year, uh, partly as the economy started to um, uh, reinvigorate itself after the, uh, the worst of the pandemic. And the returns were generally uh, pretty positive. Um, top of the table yet again is AEW UK REIT, which I, th I believe really is a quality player here. They seem to be able to um, buy very well um, and add value. And um, their returns have been very strong, con quite consistently, actually, for a, for a good period. Uh, the yield on that trust is very high. Uh, I think it's about 7% now. Um, it's not quite covered, um, but I think it, it might be in the, in the forthcoming year. Um, it's, um, it's not on a bad rating, uh, although you get slightly better value from um, Standard Life Investments Property Income, and um, I had, I had a, actually a, face, a rare face-to-face -face meeting with the, the manager recently. And um, it was really interesting because um, he was saying that actually, as a trust, they were quite, they've been quite early to, to jump onto quite a lot of trends. So they were, they were one of the first to convert to a REIT. Uh, they were quite quick to get out of retail early on. Uh, and now they're doing something really intriguing, which is that they've, they've bought quite a large amount of Scottish uh, land, um, which is they're using it for, for carbon offset, uh, because although they are very aware indeed of um, reducing their environmental footprint with their buildings and making sure that they're heated efficiently and they have uh, electric charging points and everything else, um, they 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 still realize that actually this is such an important consideration going forward. Um, and that there will come a time where any landlords that are, that do have a negative carbon cost of their buildings are gonna to have to pay for it. And so they're getting ahead of the curve here. Uh, and, and I think that um, uh, potentially, you know, this has been a very good move where not, not only will they have the carbon offset for their own portfolio, but they may have some additional carbon credits. Uh, and also I suspect that this kind of land might go up in value. So, so I think they've done quite well here. Uh, and I think it's a generally good quality trust as well. Uh, one, in my mind, there are often, I think there's, you know, the, the, there, there's a fair, a fair bit of rotation depending on which parts of the sector are in vogue. But there are three trusts very much to the fore for me, which is the two I've mentioned, plus a Picton property income, which is not on here, but that's another good quality player, actually. Uh, I'm less sure about regional REIT, which didn't have a very good year. And, and they've taken the quite bold move to, you know, to, to shift their entire portfolio into offices, uh, which I think is, um, uh, yeah, an interesting maneuver. Uh, we'll have to see, you know, whether people do go back to their offices quite as they as they did, and whether those turn out to be a good investment or not. Um, uh, I mentioned that Picton is missing from here. It, it's just that some, there's something odd about its categorization as a REIT, but it's missing from a lot of these statistics that I, I look at. Um, yeah, it comes down to uh, there's a lot of things missing here, and if we could sort this out in Morningstar, we definitely would. But um, if they're internally managed, then they're not in the stats, basically. Yeah. Which become much more obvious in the next page. Okay. Um, and, and something else that's missing from here, which I think is always worth mentioning, uh, is just is, is TR Property, which is the, the, uh, the only uh, trust that in, invests in property shares. Um, its returns were 17% over the year, which places it well up the table. Uh, I think throughout my entire career in investment trust, which was quite long, 
Uh, two, our property has been pretty much near the top of the table. So that's also one worth thinking about if you're um, wanting to diversify away from the direct asset holdings. Uh, any other sectors? Obviously, with the question marks that we've got over um, retail property and um, over offices too, because of COVID, um, alternative assets have been in demand. And the, the real winners here have been logistics. We've only got Tritex Big Box REIT on here, and this is this really alludes to what we're just talking about um, in terms of um, internally managed things on in here. Obviously, I haven't included the European ones either. Um, so you've got Eurobox and, and the ASLI, the um, Aberdeen Standard European Logistics. Um, all three of those have done very well. Things like Urban Logistics um, and uh, Stenprop have also um, been winners recently as, as we've got this need for infrastructure to support the growth of unknown retail. And that doesn't seem to be going away. Um, and the yields have been driven down quite aggressively on these, these sectors, which are dropping up valuations. Um, but healthcare too, um, both Target and Impact have been raising money and expanding buying care homes. Um, and also in the, the specialist supported living areas um, that we've been seeing, seeing some, some growth there. Um, home REITs been much more successful than the others, um, really with this focus on homelessness. Um, there's, there's an element of that in the other, other portfolios. But there's still this long-standing question mark over the, the business model of, of things like Civitas and Triple Point, which keeps getting raised, um, most recently by a short seller attacking Civitas. Um, we, we don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, definitely the, the, the rents have never stopped flowing. Um, and there, there's, there's never been really been an issue. Um, but we do get these sort of swings in the share price every now and then. But the, the, in terms of the income that they, they make, it's nice and steady stuff. Um, the, the laggard on that group is the Grand Rents Income Fund, which has been a laggard for a long time now. It may be finally emerging from its slump because it, it's got rid of its exposure to the Beaton Tower in Manchester, which is a... a an office, a residential thing, maybe it's our block, that I did in Manchester, which um, had problems with its cladding, uh, not the fireproof time, but it, I think it was just falling off. So, um, and they were um, going to get sued for that, and they then now finally managed to extricate themselves from that situation, which is good news. And now it just comes down to whether you shouldn't think ground rent should be um, uh, affected with the UK property market or not. That's the end of it. We've, we've, it's a bit of a mammoth session, but thank you very much, Andrew, for, for helping me along the way. Um, and thank you for everybody who stuck with us. I think we actually kept the audience all the way through, which is, which is good going. Obviously, we're, we're 20 minutes over the hour. Um, we will be back next week with a sort of more, more normal lineup. Um, and there's a couple of things that we've been talking about here. So we've got Geiger Counter coming in on the 21st. They're actually... Um, Placing Ian, who's, who's, who's um, now going to come in a month afterwards, the 25th of February. But obviously, Guy Count is interesting because he did so well last year and because he had a bunch of big pullback in December. And the question is going to be, you know, what's, what's the outlook for it in uh, 2022? Um, and um, but next week, um, my colleague Richard is going to be talking to the manager of uh, one of the newest entrants to the sector, Life Sciences Week, which is another kind of alternative assets investment, um, opening up a whole new sector. So it should be quite interesting. So thank you very much for everybody who tuned in and um, hopefully we will see you next week. <laughs>